thank you, Flavia, very much. Let me rephrase uh, George Orwell again and to say all meetings are equal, but some meetings are more equal than others. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here to, to Bari. What I talk about when I talk about probiotics, some of you, how many of you are running? Please raise your, your hands. Running? Running, running. So quite many. How many of you have read this book, what I talk about when I talk about running? Please raise your hands. Oh, very few. Well, I would say I'm not running anymore, but I used to run, and I ran when I read this book. So if you want to run, this is a good thing to, 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 to do. And I'm not running anywhere, but I like the title very much, so that's why I paraphrase it and I change it to what I talk about when I talk about probiotics. But this is, you know, where does it come from? So what do I talk about when I talk about probiotics? Of course I talk about microbiota, like the whole meeting here is. And this is, shows you an exponential increase in publication in the microbiota in the past decade. And almost everything has been said during the first session, so I am not really much to add at the moment, except, for example, the microbiota and microbiome. These two terms are used interchangeably in Europe, or they mean slightly different in Europe and outside of Europe. Here in Europe, we usually say it's a community of microorganisms that occupy a particular site or habit. We have all these microorganisms, and at, at some time ago, I used to say there are 10 times more microorganisms in and on us that we have cells that make up our body, but people were busy, they recalculated the number of microorganisms, and now they are saying it's 1.3. To one, so it's a new estimate ratio of bacteria to human cells. No matter what is the ratio, there is a lot of bacterial cells. So as some people are saying, we are not human, we are a walking bacterial colony, or to be more precise, microbial colony. And the reason for that are new findings, maybe not very new, but quite new, that, and this is a new study of the human microbiome that has uncovered millions of previously unknown genes from microbial communities in the human gut, skin, mouth, and vaginal microbiome. And a lot of focus is nowadays not only on bacteria, but also on viruses and fungi. And this study, which I'm showing you, also provides the largest profiles of these non-bacterial members of the microbiome. And it raised a lot of questions, like what roles of viruses, fungi, and other eukaryotic microbes, such helminths, play in human health and disease, and what new technologies need to be developed to accomplish this. And probably in future meetings, like in Chile, probably we will discuss those much more in detail. And you already heard about the studies, how to study it, who is there, what are they doing, what they can do. We also know that the microbes are not just passengers, and again, you heard a lot about it, so I will not discuss it again. Do we know the optimal health in microbiota for an infant and child? We are speaking here about all the time about healthy microbiota. But many of us, many on the audience, are like Ivan Van den Plas, who in one of his articles says the answer is probably negative, and it's probably true, which makes the whole discussion about manipulation of the microbiota more difficult if we don't know what is, uh, what is uh, normal. We discussed some of the uh, factors which influence the gut microbiota. Let me come to some of them. I will not discuss all of them. Mode of delivery. Here was a discussion about the differences between the vaginal delivery and cesarean delivery. Maria showed these beautiful slides when there are differences. Not everyone agrees with that. There were some new findings showing, like this study published in the Nature Medicine, a study of 162 mother-infant pairs that suggested that C-sections have no apparent effect on the infant microbiota by six weeks of age. This is really important for us if there are differences, if not, because, because again, if you want to manipulate, we have to know whether or not there are differences. Many people are surprised by these findings, and this are the editorial which was published also in Nature Medicine by Erika von Mutius, and she suggested perhaps there is a low number of included participants which included to this result, lack of multivariate control for potential confounding and differences in ethnicity in the previous studies. So perhaps there are some, or some explanation why these findings are different compared to what we already, the most of us, agree that there are differences. 
another factor which also was discussed, which influences the gut microbiota, is diet. Here in this audience, majority of us, I presume, are pediatricians. We are really recommending breastfeeding for good reasons because of the, uh, it has an impact on microbiota. And in the next talk, you will hear about human milk oligosaccharides that assist the growth of bifidobacteria. And again, let me cite one of these recent paper, which was published in the gut, feeding the microbiota. And one of the conclusions of the statement made by the authors, I like it very much, the most important lessons from microbial science are simple yet elegant. When we eat, we feed not only ourselves, but also our microbes. And it really, with breastfeeding, is very much true. And another factor which, again, influences the microbiota and was discussed, because it is important for us, are uh, drugs like antibiotics, the, most, the world's most overprescribed medicine. It saves life, but has a number of consequences. There's a number of consequences of overusing antibiotics in early life. Martin Blazer is one of the authors saying there's effect on diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and allergy. But it seems that the issue remains controversial because if you look at the, some recent papers, you will see no effect on the weight gain, no effect on weight gain and obesity, no effect on, um, uh, uh, on the risk of islet and celiac disease autoimmunity. So it remains, again, there may be various reasons why the results are not consistent, but it shows us that we still have to study it. And if you look again at new findings, um, uh, for example, for allergy, in line with previous uh, studies, it shows it increases the risk. So what is the effect of, of antibiotics probably still has to be studied even if probably the majority of them indicates that antibiotics do have this um, harmful effect. Uh, new findings from this study are showing that antibiotics are not the only potential drugs that affect the gut microbiota. This is a study in adults, but there are also new findings in children. This was published only a few days ago in JAMA Pediatrics, showing association between the use of acid suppressive medication and antibiotics during infancy and allergic diseases. It was a huge observational, but really large trial with almost 800,000 participants. Look at the percentage of children who are receiving drugs like, for example, PPI antibiotics or H2 receptor um, antagonists. And the findings are, the, the conclusion from this paper is do not overuse acid suppressive medications and antibiotics during infancy because the use of those drugs in the first six months of infancy was associated with an increased risk for the subsequent development of allergic diseases in childhood. And you can see the adjusted uh, hazard ratio was from 1.25 uh, to almost 2.6, depending on which allergic diseases we're looking. So this is an important finding that not only not only antibiotics, but also other drugs are important. And of course, we showed, also Flavia showed, there's a lot of uh, diseases that are being related to gut microbiota disturbances. People are asking the questions, how might microbes be affecting our weight or even brains? Some people are saying it sounds like science fiction. And if you look at the mechanism, there are many, like it's uh, through serotonin, peripheral serotonin, cytokines and metabolites like short-chain fatty acid. And again, some people are saying there's probably more speculations that hard data now. We will not. We will probably learn in future. But anyway, this biosis is something that is under the discussion, even if it remains to be determined if the alterations are a cause or the consequence. And what can be done to keep the microbiota in optimal shape, whatever is the optimal shape? And you know, there is a lot of interventions that can be done, but those which I would like to discuss, uh, summarize one of those, which I, I summarize on this slide. There are many potential strategies for gut microbiota manipulation, and probiotics are one of those. In this audience, I don't have to tell you what are probiotics, 
I just to remind you, there is an updated definition developed by the International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. And one of the important issues related to probiotics is that not all probiotics are created equal and that each one of them has to be evaluated separately. This also comes from the, uh, the, docu from the um, documents developed by the ISAP how to choose a probiotic, and this is something that people are often asking, and I think it's important. And again, probiotics are strain-specific, so genus, species, strain is important, expiration date, storage the needs, dose. There is very often, at least my country, in my country, believe that a larger dose is better. It's not always true. Formulation, and last but not least, an evidence. And on this evidence with regard to probiotics, I would like to focus. Uh, I had a chance to, to summarize the, the evidence, what are the indications for using probiotics in, this, uh, in, the, in children in this article. I will not go through all of them. I just want to, sum to summarize data on some of the indications and probably to show what are the potential possibilities or problems. So let me start with infant formula supplemented with probiotics. This is a 2017 update. Uh, we follow the methodology developed by the Cochrane collaboration, previous, previously the committee, as Espegan Committee on Nutrition, published such a document. So it was really a follow-up of the systematic review uh, which was carried out by, by the committee. Carlo Agostoni, who is sitting here in the first audience, was the first author of this paper but it was developed by the Espegan Committee on Nutrition. And uh, we looked together with my colleagues from my department on healthy term infants, on infant formula supplemented with probiotics during the manufacturing process, compared with unsupplemented infant formula, and we look mainly at the clinical outcomes. And as you can see on this slide, uh, there are a few uh, probiotic strains which were studied, and there are some possible effects, positive effects, uh, not always the same uh, outcomes were studied in all clinical trials, which makes the comparison difficult, but there are studies showing, for example, reduced GI infections, lower frequency of colic, uh, lower medium, uh, reduced GI infection, reduced respiratory tract infection. So this is a summary of possible, possible clinical effect. What I would like to call your attention on uh, decreased number of antibiotic prescription, at least this is shown in some of the studies, not unfortunately, not in all of them, it has been studied, but also lower frequency of colic irritability or spitting up episodes. And the reason I'm showing you is because I just showed you this study, do not overuse uh, acid suppressive medication and antibiotics during infancy. And perhaps it was not studied enough in previous studies, perhaps it should be included in future studies, the, the use of antibiotics and uh, antisuppressive because perhaps it's something that we did not look properly and perhaps this is the advantage or, or, or when, or, of using these kinds of, of probiotic supplemented formula. In, in this whole discussion about use and overuse of antisuppressive medication and antibiotics, this is probably something to be considered. So the summary for infant formula supplemented with probiotics the summary from our document was the administration of currently evaluated probiotic supplemented formula to health the infants does not raise safety concerns with regard to growth and adverse effects. So it's exactly like the position of Espegan Committee on Nutrition. Some favorable clinical effects are possible and the efficacy and safety should be always considered for each probiotic supplemented formula. And this one additional comment then on the probably what we should look in future trials. In Europe, one out, of 20, uh, one out of every 20 children has one or more food allergies. And one of the questions being asked, at least in my country, is to give or not to give probiotics to prevent allergic disease. And if you look at the data from or recommendation from various scientific societies, you will see that there are differences. The most recent from World Allergy Organization says no to allergy. However, when it comes to eczema, it says it's likely net benefit from using probiotics resulting primarily from prevention of eczema. 
This recommendation was based on a systematic review and meta-analysis that was published independently. And indeed, if you look at all probiotics, it reduced the risk of eczema if all probiotics were taken together by 28%. But the question is which probiotic to use, when to start, and when to stop. And people are criticizing meta-analysis on probiotics that it's mixing apples and oranges. I have to say, I used to do meta-analysis, pulling all data on probiotics, but we are not doing it for many, many years. We are always looking at individual strains. And for the purposes of this presentation, I summarize data on Lactobacillus GG, which is the only probiotic studied in more than one randomized controlled trial. It includes all the trials, including the most recent by Michael Cabana, published in Pediatrics. And here you can see there are now uh, five trials, almost 600 participants. There is reduction in the risk of eczema, unfortunately, only if we do it using the meta-analysis it done using fixed effect model. This is a model which does not take into the account heterogeneity of the included trials. If we use a random effect model, the difference is not statistically significant. So my summary for this would be for probiotics and allergy, like WA, uh, World Allergy Organization summarized, there's likely benefits in reducing the risk of eczema, but probably we still need some additional data to fully support it. But at least there, it goes in the right direction. Many of, uh, many of my colleagues who are part of the ESPEGAN working group for probiotics are present in this, in this audience. Flavia is also one of, the, one of the members, and we publish a number of documents on the use of probiotics in various conditions. But currently, we are focusing on the use of probiotics in preterm infants. Hans van Hudover, who will talk in the afternoon, and Chris van den Acker are the leading persons of this document we are working now on the use of probiotics for preterm infants. And we recently published this document, this article on probiotics for preterm infants. It was a strain-specific systematic review and network meta-analysis. For those of you who are not familiar what is the difference between pairwise meta-analysis and network meta-analysis, just very briefly to show you that the pairwise meta-analysis allows a comparison A versus B, B versus C, but if you want to compare A versus C, you are not able to do it. But network meta-analysis is a technique to gather evidence from direct and indirect comparison. So this is a main difference between those two. And we identified, can you imagine, by now we have 51 randomized control trials with more than 11,000 participants. And we are still discussing whether or not to use probiotics in preterm infants. And usually the audience, as you know, is divided by half, some people are against, strongly against, some are strongly in favor. So this is, uh, uh, Hans van Hudover will present in more detail in the afternoon. I just show you, I will just show you the natural graph of all tested probiotic strains, and there's evidence base of 25 different treatments versus a common comparator placebo, and there were only six direct head-to-head -head comparisons, and for relative effects, uh, effects plots for reduction of necrotizing enterocolitis, grades two or three, something that is probably most interesting for those of you. The good message, the good news is that we were able to identify some treatments, seven treatments out of 25 studied probiotics treatments that showed reduced necrotizing enterocolitis incidence. And I think it's really important that we are not speaking anymore about probiotics in general, but individual strain or combinations of strain to help physicians to, uh, to, to choose uh, to the probiotics. So the question is to give or not to give probiotics to preterm infants. I don't want to give you the answer because uh, we, our working group is working on it, but already at this time, first of all, you can come to the session, uh, uh, to the lecture by Hans, but also you can go to this document, which is published in Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition, and you can probably try to identify the strains which are available in your country, and then to make your um, the decision for your own setting whether or not you should use um, a, 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 a combi a strains which are in, a, a in, your, in your country. And we also identify strains which are not effective, which is equally important, not only those who are, which are effective, but also those which are not effective and should not be used. 
Another indication which I would like to show because we have some new data and also with the participation of some participants of this meeting like, like uh, Flavia and Michael Cabana, but the first author was Valerie Sang from Australia. And we have done together this individual participants' data meta-analysis on the use of lactobacillus reuteri to treat infant coli. And again, just a summary of the result. For example, at day 21, the probiotic group had approximately 25 minutes per day more reduction in crying time and or fasting duration from baseline than the placebo had. And this was a, a studies which looked at the management, as the treatment of infant I call it. Flavia, who is the chairperson of this uh, symposium, she published together with, with uh, I think, with, together with... Uh, uh, eight centers. Sorry? Eight centers. Eight centers in Italy. So there were eight centers in Italy, but also the center in, in Bari, yep. with more than 500 participants. And she showed in the preventive study, both in breastfed and in formula-fed infants, she showed um, a reduction in crying time in, prevent, in this preventive trial. So the, pre, the reduction in the crying time, approximately 25 to 47 minutes in infants with infant I coli, the question is, would you recommend probiotics for the management of infant I coli in your patients? This is a question which I often ask when I'm giving presentation of infant I coli, and this is also the question which editorialist in BMJ asked when he was, uh, and, uh, this editorial was accompanying the, one of the uh, trials by Valerie Song. Should we be treating infant colleague at all? And the question is, should we? And my answer always is, researchers like us sitting here in this audience and parents, especially at night, may differ in their opinions. So I try to summarize you only some of the indications for the, uh, of the of evidence for the use of probiotics, like infant formula supplemented with probiotics for allergy, especially for eczema, for necrotizing enterocolitis, for infant calling, showing that it's important to look at individual strains, not to discuss probiotics, but we did not answer, of course, all the questions. But the evidence for many indications is available. However, even if best evidence is available, it does not automatically lead to improved health outcomes, as you can see on this slide. And there are many barriers which extend for awareness to adherence on the part of the physician and on the part of patients. Physicians have to be aware of the evidence. They have to accept it. They have to be, be uh, the evidence should be applicable. They should be able and act on this evidence. And also patients are important because they have to be aware of the evidence, of course. They have to agree on this and also adhere to. So as you can see, once again, evidence might be available, but it still doesn't mean it is uh, results in clinical outcomes. And I started my talk with paraphrasing what I talk about when I talk about running, saying what I talk about when I talk about probiotics. I quote Haruki Murakami, and let me allow me to quote him once again. Whatever it is you are seeking won't come in the form you are expecting. It's very much true for probiotics and very much true for microbiota. Thank you very much for your attention.